This is Intro to a Method and Rate and Rhythm. In this video, we'll talk about a couple things. We'll talk about why it's important to follow a sequence of steps each time you read an EKG. I mean, really, is it really that important to be systematic? I'll answer that question for you. We'll also talk about how to figure out the heart rate, and we'll talk about how to assess the cardiac rhythm. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first question is, is it really that important to be systematic when you read EKGs? And this one is easy to answer. While we like to tell you to be systematic with the way you go about a lot of things, the EKG is unique in that if you don't have a systematic way of looking at your patient's EKG, chances are good that you've missed something. I'll give you an example. Q waves, which indicate myocardial necrosis, are often seen on the EKGs of patients who've had a prior MI, though you can also see them with acute MI. If you don't have a step where you ask yourself, hey, are there Q waves on this EKG? Then when Q waves are there, chances are pretty good that you'll miss them. So for example, this seemingly low risk patient you had scheduled to go to the operating room might actually be higher risk than you think. Or this patient you're evaluating for atypical sounding chest pain might actually have ischemic heart disease. And Q waves are just one of a number of abnormal findings you can find in a 12 lead tracing. The more you look at EKGs, the more you'll notice just how many abnormal ones are out there. For that reason, it's really important to have a sequence of steps each time you read an EKG where you ask yourself questions like, hey, are there Q waves on this tracing? How about LVH? How about RVH? Is there left atrial enlargement here? How about right atrial enlargement? Simply because these things are so easy to miss. And so my recommendation is that you memorize a sequence of steps that you go through each time you read an EKG and you practice going through EKGs until you get the hang of it. I'll show you the method that I use, but really you can use any method that works for you as long as it's something that you practice and you're comfortable going through it each time you read an EKG. So this is the method I use. It's adapted from Dale Dubin, and you can see the general categories of steps that I go through. First, I look at the tracing and I ask myself, does it look regular? And then I figure out the rate and the rhythm. I take a look at the intervals. Then I look at axis. Then I look for signs of chamber abnormalities. Okay, so this step is really important. And so for each of these, I ask myself, are there signs of LVH? Are there signs of RVH? Do we have evidence of left atrial enlargement? How about right atrial enlargement? How about low voltage? And then finally, I get to this step called infarction, which really looks at a lot more than just infarction. Okay, and so I go in alphabetical order looking for Q waves, which are signs of prior MI. And then I look for an S wave in lead one, um, which if it's there, then I look for an S1, Q3, T3 pattern, which can be seen with right ventricular pressure overload syndromes, acute or chronic. We'll talk more about that later. Then I look for ST segment abnormalities, T wave inversions, and then finally I scan the precordial leads for U waves, which can be found in hypokalemia. Again, we'll talk in more detail about these things later. So let's start with a rate. So there's a couple ways to figure out the heart rate. One method is known as a box method, where you take the number of large boxes between consecutive QRS complexes on an EKG, and you take 300 and you divide it by that number. It's important to note that the box method you can only do if the rhythm is regular. In other words, if the QRS complexes are evenly spaced. When you're dealing with an irregular heart rhythm, such as atrial fibrillation, you can't use the box method because you'll have two QRS complexes that are close to each other, and then you might have the next two that are farther away from each other. So let's try it with this EKG. So we can see here that this rhythm is regular, or the, you can see that the amount of space between each consecutive QRS complex is the same. I'm going to zoom in over here. So we can see over here these QRS complexes are about three boxes away from each other. I just found a QRS complex on the line, and I counted the number of large boxes before I got to the next one, and we can see over here there's about three. Thus, our heart rate is 300 divided by three, or approximately 100 beats per minute. Let's say we had four boxes between consecutive QRS complexes. Well, in that case, our heart rate would be 300 divided by four, or 75 beats per minute. And if you had five large boxes between consecutive QRS complexes, then your heart rate would be 300 divided by five, or 60 beats per minute. Trust me, I'm going somewhere here with this. So an easy way to figure out the heart rate is to simply memorize the numbers 300 
150, 100, 75, 60, 50. These numbers are derived from taking the number 300 and dividing it by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 large boxes. So all you have to do is recite these numbers as you tick off one large box between each consecutive QRS complex and you'll come up with the heart rate. Let's try it with this EKG. So we see here this QRS complex is on the line and we simply count off 300, 150, 100, 75. As we can see here, our heart rate is somewhere between 100 and 75 beats per minute, but it's much closer to 100. So I'll just go ahead and say our heart rate is about 90 beats per minute. Let's try it on another one. So this tracing you can see is also pretty regular. You've got a, a similar amount of space between each consecutive QRS complex, so we can use our box method. So let's go ahead and find a QRS complex that's on the line. This one looks like it's about on the line. And we'll just count off 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50. So we can see here our QRS complex is somewhere between 60 and 50. So I'll go ahead and say our heart rate here is about 55 beats per minute. If you wanted to be even more precise, instead of taking the number 300 and dividing it by the number of large boxes between consecutive QRS complexes, you could take the number 1500 and divide it by the number of small boxes between consecutive QRS complexes. Because we're bored, let's just go ahead and try that. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 26, 27, 28, we have about 28 small boxes between consecutive QRS complexes. So we can go ahead and take 1500 and divide it by 28, which gives us our heart rate of, uh, does someone have a calculator? All right, hang on, let me find my calculator. 1500 divided by 28. Okay, so it appears that our heart rate is actually approximately 54 beats per minute. I was close. So besides the box method, or the 300 divided by x, or if you're totally OCD, the, the 1500 divided by x method, there's another way you can figure out the heart rate pretty easy. And that just requires you to look at your 12-lead EKG as a whole, and consider the fact that the entire 12-lead tracing lasts for 10 seconds in duration. So all you have to do here is count the number of QRS complexes on your tracing, and multiply it by 6. So over here we can see we've got... 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 QRS complexes. 9 times 6 is, wait, let me get my calculator. No, just kidding, I don't need it. 9 times 6 is 54. The nice thing about this method of figuring out the heart rate is you can have a tracing that's irregular, such as the EKG of someone with AFib, and you can still use this because the QRSs don't have to be the same amount of distance between each other. Let's go ahead and try it with one more. This is the EKG of someone with atrial fibrillation. You can see here that the rhythm is irregular, and so to figure out the rate, I can simply count these QRS complexes and multiply by 6. So let's go ahead and do that. We got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6... 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 QRS complexes on this 10 second EKG tracing. That means our heart rate is 22 times 6 or 132 beats per minute. Okay, now I'm just showing off. Enough about rate, now let's go ahead and talk about rhythm. So the normal cardiac rhythm as we talked about is normal sinus rhythm. It's characterized by an impulse that starts in the sinus node before it makes it down to the AV nodes and then conducts to the ventricles. Because the impulse starts in the sinus node, we get an upright P wave in lead 2, and then a brief AV conduction delay before the impulse is transmitted to the ventricles. So to figure out the cardiac rhythm, I ask myself the following questions. First, is it regular? In other words, are the QRS complexes regularly spaced? Next, I ask myself, is there a P before every QRS and a QRS complex after every P wave?
Next, I ask myself, are the P waves normal? So for example, with normal sinus rhythm, you get an upright P wave in lead two. So let's try it on a couple. So here we can see that it's regular. We have a consistent amount of space between consecutive QRS complexes. Similarly, we can see that there's a P wave before every QRS complex and a QRS complex after every P wave. And finally, we can see that the P waves look normal. They're upright and lead two. Thus, here we've got normal sinus rhythm. If the rate was a little bit fast, let's say over 100 beats per minute, then we'd say we have sinus tachycardia. And if the rate was slow, let's say less than 60 beats per minute, then we'd say we have sinus bradycardia. Let's try another one. So first let's ask ourselves, is it regular? So you can see over here, it's not regular at all. It's totally irregular. This is an example of an EKG of a patient with atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is characterized by poorly defined irregular atrial activity and a very irregular ventricular response. We sometimes call it irregularly irregular. The heart rate can be fast, moderate, or slow, and there's a number of things get, that can predispose patients to developing AFib. Because the focus of this video is to go over a basic method of reading EKGs, we'll go in more detail about AFib and other arrhythmias later. Now let's go ahead and look at another EKG. I just want to know one thing, what's the rhythm? So here we can see it's pretty regular. We've got a consistent spacing between each consecutive QRS complex, but we don't really see good normal looking sinus P waves. This EKG is an example of atrial flutter. If you look closely, you can see these sawtooth flutter waves down here. And if you look even more closely, you'll notice that there's a flutter wave buried at the end of each QRS complex. That means that there's only one box separating each consecutive flutter wave, giving us an atrial rate of 300 beats per minute. Meanwhile, our ventricular rate is 150 beats per minute because our AV node can't conduct that quickly. We'll talk in more detail about atrial flutter and other arrhythmias later, but this is just to give you an idea of what it looks like. 